Yes, this is Dr. Michael Lowry. I will be presenting the 2017 EMS update. And just to let you know, we will be following through the PDF version that we have of the procedures followed by the protocols. And this uh, is something that you can also follow this lecture by looking at the Word document that we have that goes through the uh, specific changes as well as the notes that we will be discussing here. First thing I wanted to do is go through the procedures that we will be leaving off. These are the ones you do not have to uh, be concerned about. Um, and the first one is the blind insertion airway device combi tube. This is procedure AP1. This again will be left off because the combi tube is a somewhat antiquated device that is not as successful, not as safe, uh, not as uh, easy to use as what we find with the King Airway, which will be our primary focus for a blind insertion airway device. The next item that will be left off is AP3. This is a blind insertion airway device laryngeal mask airway. Again, this is a device that is best utilized with patients that are in a fasting environment in the operating room because you can get food, particulate matter, vomit around the laryngeal mask airway, which interferes with the seal. And so we will not be using the laryngeal mask airway. The next item that we will be leaving off of the procedural list is AP3. This is the blind insertion airway device eye gel. And uh, again, the eye gel likewise is best made for someone who's in a fasting environment. As you can see here, this airway does not prevent aspiration of stomach contents. And most of our patients just got through going to the Golden Corral food trough. So this is not something we will be employing. The next procedural skill which will be left off is the airway intubation nasotracheal. This is AP7. The reason for leaving this off is this is not something that we train on. You have to have a special flutter valve or a BAM device in order to perform a nasotracheal intubation. And so this skill will be left off. The next procedural skill that will not be included is PAS1. This is parenteral access arterial blood draw. And the arterial blood gas analysis is something which is going to be best utilized in the hospital setting. And this is not something that we can actually draw blood and analyze on the trucks. And so this will not be something that we will be utilizing. The next procedural skills that will not be included is PAS-10. This is parenteral access femoral line. Again, this is a central venous access line that utilizes a much longer catheter and a specialized catheterization kit. Uh, and this is not something we're going to be employing in the pre-hospital setting, and this will not be included. Next item, wanted to go through a few specific procedural skills that we would like to review in more detail. First one is going to be AP8. This is video laryngoscopy glide scope. Again, this just goes through some specifics for using a glide scope apparatus, which I think runs about eight to ten thousand dollars for the the full apparatus that they have, and this is, is something that. There are, are several different uh, versions of it. What they don't show here is they don't show the video monitor that you'll be looking at, which comes off the camera, off the base of it, where you can best visualize the vocal cords and watch the endotracheal tube go down. Uh, in addition to the glide scope as a video laryngoscope, there are other options out there. There's a McGrath. There's a King Vision. There are quite a few other cheaper but very effective options which are out there. If anyone wants to employ one of these devices, provided they go through 
appropriate in-service training and they're able to obtain all the you know all the necessary um, uh, implements and on the rest of the equipment they need we will fully be in support of uh, their efforts of doing some other form of video laryngoscopy but we just need to make sure that everyone is appropriately trained that is currently on duty with the access to the video laryngoscope. Again, note that video laryngoscopy is a advanced EMT and a paramedic level skill. Next item, wanted to bring up AP9. This is airway, drug assisted airway. Note that this is paired together with protocol AR3, which is the airway drug assisted protocol, uh, previously called the RSI or rapid sequence intubation protocol. And just want to make a, a note that the two of these are joined together and this goes through some of the specifics that you would need in order to perform the airway drug assisted. Uh, we will have a separate educational and certification tool that we will be coming out with so that we can have people appropriately trained and signed off uh, for performing the uh, airway drug assisted skill and note this is a paramedic level skill. Next item is the cardiac defibrillation dual or double. This is uh, CSP7. Again, note this is a paramedic level skill, but this is something that with the team CPR approach in particular, this is going to be uh, you know, something that all different certification levels will need to be aware of and need to have definitely some familiarity with. So the idea behind this is if a single defibrillation from one vector or one direction of energy is useful, then changing the vector of energy or having an additive shock effect will be even more useful. And, you know, again, we make a mention here, and this is you know, something we always need to emphasize, is that chest compressions are going to be consistent and only interrupted when absolutely necessary. With the pads, we note first defibrillator pads in a antero um, posterior position. This is going to be our red pads, antero postero um, uh, position. Second defibrillator pads in a antero lateral uh, position. And so the pads definitely do not you know, need to be in contact with each other. That will potentially short circuit the machine and uh, could negate the charges. And with this, there are two separate ways that you can end up performing the dual defibrillation. Uh, option one, you basically do a double simultaneous defibrillation, and that's when the provider depresses both defibrillator shock buttons simultaneously. And so it's at the exact same time Option number two is considered the dual sequential defibrillation, and that's where the provider depresses monitor one shock button and then immediately following depresses monitor shock two button. In performing the dual sequential defibrillation, what you'll find is that the vector of energy will go from one direction to another direction, and that might improve their chance of having a successful defibrillation. Again, the dual defibrillation is going to be indicated for ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC. And the dual defibrillation will be an option if a defibrillation with a single unit was not successful. As is mentioned up here, it's refractory ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia where greater than three shocks have been, uh, have been delivered uh, with unsuccessful recovery from the persistent ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC. Another note mentioned here about patients having implanted pacers and defibrillators you want to make sure that you do not place the paddles or pads directly above the device. And of course, you're getting 
a little stretched for some of your additional space that you've got available. Next item want to make a mention of PAS11. This is parenteral access intraosseous. Again, they have expanded the utility uh, of the intraosseous access now such that advanced EMTs as well as paramedics can perform the skill. Again, it would be suggested to have an EZIO, that's the bone drill uh, for this form of access, and this is a very simple, almost, almost like a carpentry type of a procedure. And we won't go through the specifics, with regards to the intraosseous access, just again make a, a note here that the proximal humerus is an acceptable site of insertion, but you want to make sure that the arm is in a position similar to being in a arm sling where you're able to get the best access to a location one to two centimeters above the surgical neck, uh, neck of the proximal humerus along the most prominent aspect of the greater tubercle. Again, for positioning, if you have the arm in a position similar to being placed in an arm sling, that's successful. The other option is to internally rotate the arm, and you could do that by uh, dragging tape around the thumb and internally rotating the arm gets you better exposure and and take the tape around the thumb and tape it uh, back around to uh, internally rotate the arm or you can even take the tape and put it onto the edge of the stretcher or if you have the patient on a backboard at the time you can use that. The advanced EMTs will end up having some specific training regarding the intraosseous access that they will have in their transition courses. Next item I want to bring up is RSP4. This is the NIPPV or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Previously this was known as CPAP, which was continuous positive airway pressure, where there was a single level of pressure which was delivered. Now this incorporates both CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure as well as bi-level positive airway pressure where there's a different uh, inspiratory pressure which is higher and then a lower expiratory pressure which allows the patient to to breathe out a little bit easier. And uh, so now, now we're able to perform both. There is a separate quick slideshow presentation that addresses some of the differences in between the two and some of the logic behind it. Just a, a quick uh, note on it is that with the continuous positive airway pressure, this is something that is better utilized with your CHF patients where you're trying to continuously push fluid out. And then likewise also with your drowning patients uh, that you may have that are potentially aspirated um, fluid into their lungs. Um, whereas the bi-level positive airway pressure is better utilized for patients that have COPD that have trouble being able to force the exhalation out against pressure. Again, as the slideshow will go through briefly, the CPAP is something that we want to continually train on and want to employ in the pre-hospital setting. And the BiPAP for this time will be something that we utilize more for interfacility transports because it's more of a long-term management type of uh, intervention that we use, not to mention the fact that it is tremendously more expensive for the BiPAP devices. Please note again that the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is now a EMT basic level skill as well as the advanced EMTs and paramedics. And the specific training for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is something that should have been covered in the transition courses in more detail.
Next item, I want to make a mention of gastric tube insertion. Again, this is a paramedic level skill. This is USP3. And the mention here is that we should not administer charcoal in patients with altered mental status by gastric tube insertion due to the risk of aspiration of charcoal into the lungs. And the charcoal by way of a gastric tube is no longer recommended by North Carolina Poison Control. With the gastric tube insertion, of course, you can go down by way of the nasal passages, but if you have a patient that is intubated or they have significant facial trauma, then oral insertion of the tube may be considered or preferred after securing the airway. Next item is USP4. This is injections, subcutaneous and intramuscular. Want to make a mention here that you see EMTs listed also as being allowed to perform the IM injections regarding epinephrine, which can be given for anaphylaxis by the IM route. For EMTs to perform a second injection of epinephrine for anaphylaxis, they need to call into medical control prior to approval. Another quick caveat on this is while you do not see medical responder listed here, we are allowing all certification levels to administer Narcan, which is naloxone, intramuscular, as well as intranasally, and that would be medical responders on up uh, can administer Narcan intramuscular. What you'll find is that law enforcement is also able to perform a intramuscular injection of Narcan. And so the medical board in viewing the necessity of having immediately available Narcan uh, to the general population, they thought it best to relax the restriction for law enforcement and all first responders, including medical responders, to give Narcan by a intramuscular route. So while you'll see only EMTs are listed here, it may be something that the medical responders may want to also learn better and review this one procedure. Next item I wanted to bring up is going to be our last procedure, but this is perhaps the most important change that we have, and this is going to be WTP2, wound care trauma section, spinal motion restriction. Note that this is a procedure which is set up from medical responder all the way through paramedic, and it is paired together with protocol TB8, selective spinal motion restriction, which is a EMT basic level protocol, which goes through the criteria where you do not have to spinal motion restrict a patient. Again, the changes based upon research is that we do not want to be creating bed sores and causing additional problems by placing patients on spine boards. So they make a, a mention here that spine boards or similar rigid devices should not be used during transport or during interfacility transfers. They should be utilized for extrication and or patient transfers as well as to uh, as support for chest compressions, but do not improve outcomes and cause significant problems with pain, agitation, anxiety, respiratory compromise, as well as the tissue breakdown along the pressure points. Now, again, while we will, are using the long spine boards less, please do continue to employ the rigid cervical immobilization collars because the main place that you're going to end up causing additional injury to a patient is if you do not appropriately immobilize their cervical spine. That's where you have more of an opportunity of motion as the head tends to roll around and bob back and forth, but the rest of the torso 
tends to maintain itself in a, in a pretty stable position once you have them on a stretcher in a supine position. So again, use the cervical immobilization collar judiciously, but limit the use of the long spine boards. Want to make a mention here that you should never force a patient into a non-neutral position to immobilize them. Uh, if you notice, especially the elderly, they basically are, you know, tilted forward. Looks like they're they're looking for change on the ground with their normal position, and they are basically due to arthritic changes and spondylosis of the cervical spine, are always limited in that position where they're almost in a sniffing position or leaning their head forward. And if you straighten them out, then you potentially could be breaking their cervical spine. So always be attentive to what the patient's normal uh, neutral position is that they maintain their neck. Again, not to go into too much detail on the procedure here, but uh, definitely want you to review this in its entirety and you can read appropriately later. But make a mention here, once the patient arrives at the stretcher, remove the rigid spinal immobilization restriction device while maintaining spinal alignment using a log roll or multi-rescuer lift technique and transfer and secure the patient to the stretcher for transport. Note that the log roll technique for football players wearing pads is not considered the ideal type of way to roll them over due to the pads disrupting the spinal alignment. In that case, it's best to use a multi-rescuer lift technique. Something else I want to go through here, and this is something mentioned in the Word document, and it's entitled the Coordinated Care of Student Athletes with Potential Spine Injury. This is a joint position statement from the NC High School Athletic Association and the NC Office of EMS. Again, to run through some of the educational points, they again make a mention about trying to get the uh, patient, the student athlete, off the backboard for the transport into the hospital. They make mention that athletic trainers and equipment managers are the experts in the protective equipment worn by athletes. There's discussion about the emergency action plan that should be developed from the uh, athletic team and in conjunction with the EMS so that they can discuss the use of backboards, the uh, specific drills that should occur, and some of the other procedures that should occur in the event of a injured student athlete. These emergency action plan or EAP drills should occur at least annually at the start of football season, uh, and they can briefly be brushed on again at the start of each football game to review the game response and the practice field response and to know exactly where all the resources are. They also make a mention of having a system of notification for EMS to come onto the field and they suggest using a raised fist and you know, this again ought to be reviewed with the pregame meeting and EAP drill before the game. For the football player with a suspected spinal injury, they make a mention of trying to remove the face mask as soon as possible. And there can be quick release mounts, but occasionally you need a cordless screwdriver or manual screwdriver and even a cutting tool to remove the face mask. There's a discussion of the two different options regarding moving a patient while maintaining spinal motion restriction and the one option of leaving the gear on for the initial transport into the back of the ambulance and the other option of removing the gear on the field and then transporting them into the ambulance. 
of course with both options once you get them into the ambulance prior to transport you want to take the efforts to remove the gear and gain better access to the patient so you can perform a better assessment of course while maintaining spinal mobilization as indicated again the recommendations go through that a log rule is no longer recommended except for prone athletes athletes that are face down there may be a, an initial log roll performed to try to bring them over, but it's done with, with plenty of additional assistance, including the sports medicine professionals, the athletic trainers, and the coaches to try to maintain spin, spinal immobilization. And with the supine preferred method of raising a patient up to put them on a backboard, to try to transport them in. It's recommended to use something called an eight-man lift, where there's literally eight people that are, are each grabbing a portion of the patient to raise them up. Of course, with the, the main emphasis being upon the head and neck to try to maintain the mobilization. With rolling the patient over from a prone position onto a device which would be onto a, a spinal board so you can move them again. The recommendation is to perform a log push to roll the athlete rather than pulling them over because it's a little bit better to maintain the immobilization of the spine with pushing them over. With helmet and pad removal the recommendations are to have a minimum of four people, if possible, to try to remove the helmet and pads. And they recommend a levitation method of having the rescuers at the following positions, and that would be at the helmet, at the neck, and one at each shoulder. In the Word document, there's also several links to YouTube videos as well as other links to different uh, protocols as well as the Nath National Athletic Trainers Association sites with regards to some of their specific recommendations. This is the end of the 2017 EMS update regarding procedural changes. The next item will be discussing the protocol changes. Yes, this is Dr. Michael Lowry. I'm going to be reviewing the 2017 EMS protocols, and this is the uh, update that we have in place for the medical responders, EMT basics, as well as the advanced EMTs. Uh, if someone wants to go into more detail and review the paramedic level changes and interventions, they're more than welcome to do so. And we will allude to a few of the paramedic changes just so that everyone is aware on the, the patient care team. Uh, but um, there will be more detail in their version of the update. Um, one thing also, again, want to mention, do not print any final copies of the protocols uh, as of yet because uh, North Carolina Office of EMS is still yet to make about 20 to 25 uh, changes and edits. Now there are minor changes but uh, still I wouldn't print up a final copy quite yet until we give you instructions that they're done with their part. Um, you see the protocol index um, here and we will kind of run through it. This makes it real easy to follow the protocols uh, and they're also color-coded. Um, we start off, of course, with a protocol introduction. I wouldn't worry about that. The uh, universal protocols are uh, light green colored, and that's uh, UP. Um, and you see what's listed down there as we move down to airway respiratory section. That's AR. Those are light blue. Adult cardiac section is dark blue. And Adult medical section, AM, is olive green. Adult obstetrics is AO, and that's dark purple. Trauma and burn is TB, not tuberculosis, but still TB, and that's red. 
and then we get down to pediatric cardiac section which is PC light purple and pediatric medical section is PM gray blue toxin environmental section is TE which is gold and then there's special circumstances which is SC or black and that's a like a suspected viral hemorrhagic fever for Ebola or whatever other transmissible disease is going to come from overseas we just can kind of kind of uh, adjust it for this and then there's also the special operations section uh, which is SO which is gold for scene rehabilitation uh, for uh, uh, first responders um, responding to uh, uh, major events or uh, fires or other uh, 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 events one thing to make a mention of um, the there's a pediatric medical pediatric cardiac section but there's no pediatric respiratory section to find that you again go up to the airway respiratory section um, to find the pediatric component of it just to point that out one thing I wanted to mention in the behavioral uh, protocol this is UP6 um, again we have have uh, several different options and how to appropriately uh, sedate and control aggressive violent uh, agitated patients um, and uh, definitely request whatever it is that you can from the paramedic or additional paramedic assistance um, they make a mention about a CIT paramedic only um, that's listed uh, down over here and what this is a uh, CIT is a crisis intervention team and this is optional but there are several counties which are are moving towards a community paramedicine slash crisis intervention team approach for the uh, uh, excited delirium patients and patients with uh, psychiatric disturbances but um, uh, we're not quite yet doing this but this may be a consideration moving forward and under pain control which is going to be UP 11 um, we have taken out aspirin and the reason is that aspirin uh, given for for pain um, is not the best option it would be better to go with ibuprofen or Tylenol um, and then on the advanced EMT side you've got uh, uh, also uh, Toradol is an option. Uh, concern for aspirin is it can cause gastritis more, it can prolong bleeding times, uh, and um, certainly if there's um, you know a headache with a, a intracranial hemorrhage, you wouldn't want to give aspirin or abdominal pain, definitely, which could be secondary to gastritis or a GI bleed. Aspirin would be contraindicated in those uh, circumstances. And next is suspected stroke which is UP14 uh, just wanted to make a mention here uh, that um, the time cutoff for us you know calling a stroke alert to the hospital is actually time of onset or time last seen normal is less than six hours um, previously it was three hours and 4.5 then five hours so it, now it's at six uh, and some of this is based upon the changes uh, in policy with regards to uh, when you can give thrombolytic therapy for a stroke and right now we're at 4.5 hours for thrombolytic therapy but in eastern North Carolina through Vidit Medical Center in Greenville we have now the option of performing intra-arterial lytic options by neurosurgery uh, or they can do something called a interventional embolectomy where they um, for the embolectomy they go in and literally pull a clot out of the brain intravascularly uh, they go into you know blood vessel down in the groin or in the arm and go in and pull out the clot uh, intraarterial lytic options is where they go in right next to the clot in the brain and dissolve it and right now they're uh, using a nine hour window where they will still do that procedure um, there's some consideration for going up to 12 hours for that but um, um, so this is what's kind of prolonged our window that we're looking at here another thing just to make a mention of uh, is with regards to um, we have a, a 
system stroke plan that we're abiding by. But uh, there's also a mention here about um, systolic blood pressures in excess of 220, diastolics greater than 120 with a pulse over 60. Um, then there is an option available for giving a medication to lower the blood pressure. So just to, something to make the paramedic aware of if you're seeing these elevated blood pressures when there's a suspected stroke that they may have some options uh, available for administration of medication to lower the blood pressure. Next up is airway drug assisted protocol. This is AR3. Again, this used to be called the RSI protocol, which was the rapid sequence intubation protocol that we used to have. And this, again, is a paramedic level protocol, but a couple of things to just want to make everyone aware of, again, from a planning perspective, is that you have to have two paramedics on scene and just kind of you know, something as a reminder for getting additional resources, which is the responsibility of the entire team. The other thing is you will hear a medication called ketamine. Ketamine is a, uh, a you know, sedative uh, you know, uh, agent that we can use to try to help facilitate the assisted airway, uh, and it can be used in place of another sedative hypnotic agent, uh, Atomidate. And uh, ketamine is um, uh, useful because it can also be used for a, a dangerously combative patient where you don't have an IV, and they can actually do a shot of ketamine in the arm, but they do that for somebody who's dangerously combative and is going to require an airway at some point, someone who's hypoxic or hypotensive uh, or dangerously combative. But uh, again, just to make you aware uh, in case this is used, and then likewise, yeah, that it is an option, that um, if you uh, don't have any other choice, this is something to remind your paramedic about. One other thing to bring up, this is pediatric airway AR5, and then there's also a pediatric failed airway, which is AR6. And I just wanted to bring up that there's, you'll see a box open here, um, and uh, also one on uh, AR6. And this is uh, where we have removed the airway cricothyrotomy needle procedure. And this is where they take a needle and stick it into the cricothyroid membrane to ventilate the patient, which is very dangerous, is not very effective, and requires extremely extensive skills training and usually recommended for a, a cadaver lab um, or an animal lab. And this is uh, not something that we're going to be supporting or including in the protocols. And here we have uh, post-intubation, uh, BIAD, or blind insertion airway device management. And this, this is a protocol for after a patient is intubated or the blind insertion airway has been placed. Uh, the thought is that you need to appropriately sedate the patient. The, likewise, the patient needs to be restrained. So the uh, arms need to be tethered down even if you think they're not going to wake up uh, because if they do and they uh, go to take out that airway, then you've got a mess on your hands. So um, I mentioned this uh, to everyone just because there are multiple options to try to sedate the patient um, after the uh, airway has been placed. And this is just something to, to illustrate uh, uh, so that uh, a good thing to, to remind the paramedic of if you do see the patient stirring around or at potential for losing their ET tube or their blind insertion device. Likewise, uh, we're uh, at the ventilator emergencies. This is AR9. And um, something, because there are commonly other EMS providers in the back when a, a patient is being transported on a ventilator, that when the alarms go off and there's some type of an issue, there's a certain thing that you want to go through to look and, and make sure that there's not a not a, uh, a specific type of thing that can be corrected, but one, one thing to keep in mind uh, with ventilator emergencies is the DOPE algorithm, which is a, if there's a displaced endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube, or if it's obstructed, which could be from, from uh, a mucus plug or 
or food particles or something else. The other one is pneumothorax, which is something that all of us can assess for, which can happen when somebody's under positive pressure or after any trauma. Um, and then the other one is equipment failure, which is kind of troubleshooting sometimes the plumbing, sometimes the electrical aspect of it. So just want to bring that up. Next up is tracheostomy tube emergencies. Uh, the, you know, a lot, lot of what's listed down here uh, goes to the advanced EMT level, um, but for uh, everyone to review is the pictures uh, that are listed here that that mention all of the equipment. You know, the obturator, the you know the 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 cannula, the flange, the you know where where there's a uh, a uh, balloon and, and some do not have a balloon on it but it's a good idea to familiarize yourself with all the hardware with one of these because sometimes when you get to your patient some of the parts are missing or sometimes somebody has shoved a inner cannula in or uh, displaced something that may be a part of it so just look at this and some of it is kind of look for what's missing in case there's an emergency Next up is the chest pain cardiac and STEMI protocol, which is AC4. And bring up here that when a patient is having a STEMI, which is an ST elevation MI, having an acute heart attack, uh, one option available is if the blood pressure is high enough, systolic greater than 120, pulse greater than 60, there's a consideration for giving metoprolol a beta blocker which reduces blood pressure and pulse rate uh, to try to help prevent the heart attack from extending and it likewise prevents arrhythmias from occurring uh, so that we're not having to to perform cardiac arrest scenarios as frequently so just something as a consideration and again this is a new medication uh, that the paramedics will be using and just wanted to make you aware of it another thing to make a mention of is pre-hospital EKG transmission of, of um, you know, taking a photo of the EKG and sending it into a facility uh, is HIPAA compliant. It uh, assists in um, you know, trying to get the information across uh, in a as protected of a fashion as can be accomplished given the need to uh, transmit the information uh, and this is very important to help make decisions about which uh, facility to go to uh, as to whether or not to go directly to a catheterization lab or to go to the closest hospital and likewise it helps alert the practitioner and staff at the receiving hospital so that they can get the lytics ready and have the uh, you know respiratory handy, have x-ray handy, and have everything that they need to appropriately take care of the patient. Um, they can actually pull up an old EKG and compare it. Um, it's uh, really something which helps out quite a bit. Now, um, sending it to the facility or even to a staff member present at the facility is HIPAA compliant. Um, certainly, uh, after doing that, just destroy the evidence off your phone. Um, and don't send the, the image to anyone else, uh, and you'll still be uh, HIPAA compliant. Regarding locations of where to send your patient, certainly unstable patients in, at risk of immediate cardiac arrest um, or extremely unstable vitals need to go to the closest location. Um, but if you have a stable patient, look at your destination plan to see whether or not to bypass a closer facility that does not have cardiac catheterization capabilities to go to a, uh, a PCI uh, center, a percutaneous interventional center that can do a catheterization because that is a, a higher standard of, uh, standard of care. Likewise, always consider aeromedical transport as needed uh, to try to facilitate that transfer to a location with a PCI center. Next up is congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema protocol. This is AC5. And make a mention here with regards to, uh, you know, trying to administer nitroglycerin to help out with, with CHF and pulmonary edema episodes. And the patient does not even have to have 
chest pain if they're having a CHF flare-up with dyspnea and other associated signs and symptoms. As mentioned up here, the nitroglycerin is indicated. And we have put in a handy chart here for the advanced DMTs um, to use, uh, which you know basically gives the systolic blood pressure uh, readings that w and how much nitroglycerin paste that you should administer. Um, we have uh, you know systolic greater than 100, one inch; greater than 150, 1 1.5 inches; greater than 200, two inches. Another thing to mention, because you you may hear the the medication, is ACE inhibitor um, is a angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, which is utilized for congestive heart failure to uh, reverse CHF, and it does lower blood pressure down. But just to let you know, that's new in the protocols. It is paramedic level, um, and it is something that they've got to have a blood pressure over. 120 systolic uh, in order to administer. Uh, the other thing to make a note to everybody uh, is that CPAP for CHF, you do not want to use CPAP when systolic blood pressure is less than 100 systolic. And should the patient become hypotensive with a systolic less than 100, then remove the CPAP and treat the patient according to the proper protocol. Um, and, of course, CPAP and BiPAP, um, now referred to as non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, uh, those are now EMT basic level skills. Next is target temperature management. This is uh, optional, and this is going to be AC10. And this protocol more so deals with patients that have have already been resuscitated uh, from a cardiac arrest scenario and are already being cooled down while being transported to another location. And note that these patients would all be intubated after a resuscitation attempt. Part of the reason this is optional is that there are no studies to date that demonstrate improved neurologic outcomes with pre-hospital initiated cooling. So the best approach is for the post-arrest scenario in the pre-hospital setting. There may be a consideration for exposing and applying ice packs to the axillary region and the groin region, but above and beyond that, I wouldn't invest in cooling blankets or do anything else. Uh, certainly for interfacility transports, if somebody's initiated the uh, cooling, then you're going to have to continue it with whatever equipment that uh, they provide. Next item is team-focused CPR, and this is required. It's not going to be just optional. And this is AC11. I uh, just want to make a mention the team-focused CPR approach uh, quickly is basically keeping the patient on scene until you have either got a return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC or until you've run through the algorithm appropriately for the on-scene resuscitation termination of CPR, which is going to be AC12, and you know stopping CPR and, and basically uh, terminating the resuscitative attempts there on scene. So what we find is that by staying on scene and bringing all the resources in on scene to uh, attempt the resuscitation, you stand a much better chance of getting the return of spontaneous circulation. And uh, even more importantly um, is uh, that you stand a better chance of the patient surviving neurologically intact and being able to be discharged from the hospital neurologically intact. And some some programs that have incorporated team-focused CPR have boasted, uh, you know, almost 50% increases in their uh, number of cardiac resuscitations that have walked out of the hospital alive, which is something we all should be excited about. And what what this this advocates for is, you know, not just the EMS unit responding, but basically 
you know, all first responders uh, going in, you know, you know, incorporating your, your fire response definitely, but then, you know, potentially bringing in the police uh, to assist with CPR. And uh, this is a great program. They've got a, uh, a um, kind of a delineation of duties for who shows up first versus second and third and how to how to establish the uh, the hierarchy and the rotation and how to go about it. And then likewise, the reasons that you would terminate it. And this is where you terminate it. And a lot of this is based upon entitled CO2 readings, which is going to be the paramedic level. But it's basically when you're in entitled CO2 or the level of carbon dioxide coming out of a patient drops down so low, that means there's no metabolic activity, there's no perfusion, and there's no chance of survival. The next item to bring up is allergic reaction anaphylaxis, and this is AM1. And essentially what to bring up with this is that for epinephrine, the epinephrine uh, IM injections, uh, which are given for allergic reaction, this is now a medical responder level intervention. Uh, so um, the medical responders and higher can, can give epinephrine uh, based upon the algorithm. And if it needs to be repeated, um, you can see here the advanced EMT can repeat the epinephrine IM injection um, without calling in for medical control. But if a basic or medical responder sees a need to repeat the epinephrine, then they can just call in to medical control uh, to ask for permission to uh, repeat the epinephrine. Um, another you know, thing which is useful for allergic re reactions that's a advanced DMT level is the histamine H2 blocker and that's going to be basically your Pepsid, Zantac, and Tagamet and we've got weight-based dosings and the maximums um, here uh, for you know whatever age and size of patients and we have more than one option listed for the H2 blockers Pepsid, Zantac, Tagamet just because the shortages in medications uh, that uh, are there. Um, the mention here of epinephrine IV or IO, uh, that is for severe allergic reactions that are not responding, and that's a IV formulation, which is uh, paramedic level only. And next item is diabetic adult, and this is going to be AM2. And want to make a, a mention here that, of course, you know, given oral glucose is a medical responder level, uh, uh, you know, part of the protocol, and uh, you've got the D50, um, which is at the advanced uh, EMT level, and um, some, something to keep in mind, and I've put it in the pearls here just to read this off, is when you give D50 or oral glucose or some other medication or perform an intervention to bring up a low blood sugar, then the requirement is to call medical control for advice prior to obtaining a patient refusal. And again, anytime you perform any intervention uh, with giving a medication or other, other skill level, a good idea to call medical control prior, prior to allowing them to sign a patient refusal um, in general, but with uh, uh, you know, trying to raise up somebody's blood sugar, it's even more important. And the reasoning is, is that there is going to be a specific reason that the patient was hypoglycemic. I mean, it could be that they uh, uh, either overdosed on their medication accidentally or otherwise, or they uh, are being prescribed too much medication. Um, it can be from renal failure, commonly seen where the kidneys don't work as well and they don't clear the medication out well enough. Uh, so the, uh, the diabetic medications concentrate and end up causing uh, them to drop the sugar. Um, the other one could be from due to uh, weight loss. Um, they don't need as much insulin if they lose weight or uh, other medications to control their diabetes. It could be as simple as not enough food or calorie intake, which is what we'd like to think, but then it can also be something like infection or sepsis, 
which basically the body consumes more calories in responding to it and mounting a fever. So it's um, very common that we'll see somebody with hypoglycemia several times in a row that gets treat, you know, treated and released and they keep coming back until they come in for definitive care and figure out why it's happening. So to prevent the next shift from giving you a hard time, uh, you know, by calling the next night for returning for the same complaint, then, you know, call in for medical controls advice or just if you can talk them into being transported in, then we can figure it out on the other end. Next is going to be hypertension, which is going to be protocol AM number four. reason I, I bring this up is that they put in a good preamble here that basically makes mention that, you know, hypertension is not uncommon, especially in the emergency setting. Hypertension is usually transient and in response to stress and or pain. And I bring that up from the standpoint that you know, very commonly when somebody comes into the emergency department with hypertension, what we do is nothing. We basically, you know, try to relax them, calm them down, put them into to a, a room where they're by themselves, if possible, um, not out in the hallway. And we usually kick some of the family members out and we'll turn the TV on and just sit there. And very commonly, the blood pressure comes down with us doing nothing. So just one thing before we overreact to it, um, you know, just something to kind of keep in mind. Now, you know, certainly if you've got somebody with hypertension and stroke, pregnancy, chest pain, CHF, then that's going to going to go to a different response. With a pregnancy, the hypertension, you're, you're worried about uh, preeclamptic or eclamptic states. But uh, just something to, to keep in mind, just trying to keep them calm will tend to help out matters uh, sometimes more than anything. Next item to bring up is hypotension and shock. And um, they, this is AM5. And just wanted to bring this up because it's, uh, I like the way they have this laid out, is that you get your history and physical exam to help suggest which type of shock it is. And this is, this is very useful in knowing how to treat it. But, you know, is it cardiogenic, which is, you know, related to the heart not working as well or heart attack? Is it hypovolemic where they don't have enough, you know, volume, they're dehydrated or it could be lack of blood um, that's causing it, uh, hypovolemia? Um, is it distributive, uh, which would be kind of like your sepsis or allergic reaction, uh, you know, type of response where you're just, your vascular tone is just dilated out? Um, you know, from the, the, the allergic reaction or sepsis or infection. Uh, then obstructive, um, which would be like a tension pneumothorax, um, or you could even have an obstruction from an aortic dissection that blocks off the blood flow. Um, so just, you know, something to, to think about, and you can get a lot of that from your, your uh, history. The next one I wanted to bring up is the multiple trauma protocol, which is TB6, and just want to bring up first off that bleeding control, stopping bleeding must occur before IV access uh, is attempted, and um, it's just you want to stop what's, what's going out as best, best you can uh, for where, where you can control it with a tourniquet or direct pressure or otherwise what's necessary. Also wanted to bring up TXA, which is something new that you need to be aware of. Um, but when you have got the trauma patient with hypotension and evidence for shock, TXA, which is transexemic acid, is an option that the paramedics may be utilizing. And uh, just kind of going into some details on it here, uh, we, we see with, with transexemic acid, indications greater than age 18 um, or eight, 18 and up um, in uh, patients that have got signs or symptoms of shock or suspicion of internal hemorrhage or anticipation of needing a blood transfusion. Um, indications would be hypotension, blood pressure less than 100 systolic, heart rate greater than 110, altered level of consciousness, somebody who's pale, diaphoretic, Contraindications would be if the time is greater than three hours from onset of injury, 
or if there's a shock that has theoretically been controlled from from continued blood loss by either a tourniquet direct pressure or minimal uh, continued blood loss. In other words, you know, they got their arm chopped off, but hey, you've got it stopped with a tourniquet now. Um, the other uh, you know, contraindication would be if it's non-traumatic shock. You know, it's a shock from sepsis or a shock from an allergic reaction uh, or some non-hemorrhagic shock. Um, the other thing is uh, there's contraindications if there's a previous history of DVT, PE, or stroke. Um, with the TXA, patient should be transported to a trauma center uh, if possible. Again, you're treating a uh, paradigm of symptoms that usually can't be taken care of well without a, a dedicated trauma service. Um, the loading dose, uh, one gram and 100 ml normal saline over 10 minutes. Um, again, that's paramedic level, but you still need to know the re rest of the uh, the parameters for uh, TXA and why they're giving it. So again, focuses on the use for suspected internal hemorrhage. Um, and, you know, if somebody's like we we're saying, you know, had a shunt where the bleeding stopped, the amputation's been controlled, you know, they're not going to benefit quite so much because there are some secondary side effects and a, a downside with the uh, slight hypercoagulability, which will result. The other thing to make a mention of here for the advanced DMTs is uh, the permissive hypotension. The idea used to be that you would just flood them with fluids because they're, they're lost blood here, but the idea is you shoot for a blood pressure systolic target of about 90 in trauma patients with suspected hemorrhage. You don't want to give them too much fluids because it just encourages more bleeding or the higher blood pressure blows the clot off. And then likewise, the lower temperature from the room temperature fluids ends up changing the coagulation parameters where you don't clot as well due to the lower intravascular temperature and you're also diluting the clotting factors. So just something to keep in mind. Next up, I want to bring up the TB8. This is the selective spinal motion restriction protocol and this is paired together with the procedure WTP2 spinal motion restriction that we went through in detail. Again, you see with the changes, whereas this previously was only a paramedic protocol, now it is a EMT basic level protocol and algorithm where EMT basic can follow through the questions and answers and proceed down to the point of not employing any specific spinal motion restriction here. And more specifically with the changes, they have taken out the age 65 or greater or age five or less, which was one of the other branch points in the algorithm. And the realization being that you should be able to get a reasonable enough exam where you can rule out a spinal cord injury with these ages, but be wary that age 65 or greater is very, very likely to have some type of a spinal injury with a very minimal mechanism. And likewise, your age five or less is going to be somewhat scared of you during the exam and may not be able to be trusted. Also, something different is previously they just mentioned significant mechanism of injury. Here they're giving you more specifics of high energy events such as motor vehicle ejection, a high fall, and abrupt deceleration crashes would be things that should constitute a significant mechanism of injury. So again, we make mention here that long spine boards are not considered the standard of care in most cases of potential spinal injury, that spinal motion restriction with cervical collar and securing the patient to the cot while padding all pressure point areas is appropriate in most cases. The big take home on this is when in doubt, stick on a C collar. Nobody is going to fault you on that one. 
and that way you can enact some spinal motion restriction but you do not have to go with the long spine board. Something else with regards to the distracting injuries here, if they have some other significant injury, they may not be paying much attention to their cervical spine injury. And likewise, if they're intoxicated, you in essence really can't trust them. Got to stick a, a cervical collar on them. Next item I want to bring up is traumatic arrest. This is TB10. It's listed as optional. This is one that we will adopt. And this uh, basically just recognizes the fact that if somebody is in asystole and or has a pulseless electrical activity with a rate less than 40, uh, you know, uh, chances are you're not going to be able to bring them back from a traumatic arrest. And that's one of the reasons we will be calling some resuscitations in the field. Uh, because from definitely blunt arrest, if you get down that far, you're not coming back. Penetrating arrest, yeah, sometimes because it's a, you know, it's a, uh, you may have a little bit better of a response. And so that one goes a little bit further by checking pupil reflexes and looking for other body movement uh, there. So just something to uh, review. And next is pediatric allergic reaction, and this is going to be PM1, and this one reads very similarly to the uh, adult allergic reaction, and um, there's not a whole lot of difference in this. Again, the medical responders are giving epinephrine, uh, and um, you know medical responders and basics need to call if they have to repeat it, uh, and then um, the uh, advanced EMTs can repeat the epinephrine and then paramedics of course are doing the IV epinephrine um, with things and the pearls reflect that and reflect the uh, the um, H2 blockers uh, Pepsid Zantac Tagamet um, which are, are a advanced EMT skill or medications that are weight-based dosing uh, down here And again, should mention that the EpiPen and EpiPen Junior kits are extremely expensive, so we are allowing uh, epinephrine to be drawn up in a syringe labeled and dated as one option to uh, try to reduce the financial burden. Next item is pediatric diabetic protocol and this is PM3 and again we make a mention that if you are correcting a diabetic hypoglycemia then please call into medical control. Um, we of course have got oral glucose and uh, juices you know other other types of food um, that uh, could could potentially be given if the patient is alert enough to take it um, and uh, you're there's no concern for the airway um, for administering uh, IV glucose of course for younger ages you do dilutional um, you know, dextrose instead of giving the full-fledged D50 for uh, over age two years um, it's uh, safer to give a diluted version of it uh, age one to two years it's D25 and under one year of age is D10 and Instructions in how to uh, dilute that out appropriately are listed down here for convenience, and that's uh, for D10. You add in, um, you know, normal saline, um, and uh, same thing for D25. And this just kind of shows a simple way to do it. Next item is going to be drowning, which is TE3. And as we see here in the free text version, we make a mention of the dive accident barotrauma uh, uh, alert. This is for the Divers Alert Network. It's got the phone number. They also call it DAN. And uh, note that DAN no longer recommends the head down position uh, uh, that they previously used to recommend. Um, they want to keep patients with suspected arterial gas embolism supine 
so you don't don't raise their head or lower their head just keep them flat uh, there's also a mention here about consider CPAP for responsive patients with near drowning um, this is of course something which is the EMT basic level and higher intervention that can be performed with applying CPAP to the near drowning patients a couple other things to make note of here first off a uh, foam is usually present in the airway and may be copious do not waste time as attempting to suction foam ventilate with bag valve mask through the foam and suction solid water I say solid water but you know suction water and vomit only when present other thing to make a mention of is spinal motion restriction is usually unnecessary when indicated it should not interrupt ventilation oxygenation and or CPR next up is hyperthermia and this is TE4 and want to make a mention here from the the pearls is a reminder that rapid cooling takes precedence over transport as early cooling decreases morbidity and mortality so they make a mention of ice water bath immersions and doing everything you can to try to get the temperature down the goal temperature is to try to get them to 102.5 degrees Fahrenheit before you become a little bit less aggressive another mention is with the hypothermia frostbite protocol this is TE5 again hypothermia and frostbite are going to happen when it's cold outside and chances are our trucks are going to be a lot cooler also and thus our fluids will be a lot cooler so just a mention made here when you're trying to rehydrate them attempt warmed IV fluids not to exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit but uh, giving cold fluids to a hypothermic patient probably doesn't help quite as much next item is marine envenomations and injury and just a, a note made especially the salt water environment that we're looking at is uh, with uh, jellyfish anemones and man of wars as they make a mention about lifting away the tentacles apply vinegar rinse or clean seawater and do not use fresh water or ice as that could cause the nematocysts to uh, discharge and make the pain and injury worse and again everyone knows stingrays get hot water and next is overdose toxic ingestion this is TE7 and again this basically shows that naloxone can be given by any certification level um, and uh, from you know from medical responder uh, and and higher and the naloxone uh, can be given in any format whereas uh, normally they don't allow the IM injections to be performed um, by medical responders for naloxone they're allowing anyone to perform an IM injection they uh, although they're not regulated uh, quite the same way but they're allowing police officers to give IM Narcan just because some of the Narcan kits come with the IM injectable uh, form of it instead of having the intranasal for, uh, form which is what we usually recommend because both of them have essentially the same absorptive rate one other thing with regards to the the overdose toxic ingestion protocol to make mention of is that there is stronger emphasis that's being placed upon the use of charcoal when the ingestion has been within an hour or if there is an extended release agent or an agent that slows down GI motility so um, basically uh, narcotics or benzodiazepines would slow down GI motility and those uh, would be something where you may go over that one hour time frame uh, and administering charcoal um, again um, char charcoal every bit that goes in comes out it's a, a, a 
you know, safe to take, but you have to make sure that there's no concern for aspiration risk, that the patient is definitely protecting their airway. In the pearl section regarding charcoal, uh, we make a mention of the dose, one gram per kilogram, maximum 50 grams, and um, patient must be alert and able to protect their airway, safely swallow, and charcoal is ineffective against metals such as sodium, potassium, and lithium, and alcohols and glycols. It is also not recommended for ingestion of corrosive chemicals such as acids and alkalis. And finally, we get to scene rehabilitation. We have general, which is SO1, and then you've also got a responder scene rehabilitation. Um, uh, both these listed here is optional. This one's SO2, but uh, we're going to uh, definitely want to require these. These are very useful for trying to uh, help out with scene responses where we're trying to take care of first responders uh, and, you know, uh, with fire suppression uh, attempts or any other type of a mass casualty uh, event or, um, you know, just for um, any type of a scene response. Um, the one thing to bring up here is that they uh, talk about separating into heat stresses and cold stresses. Uh, one thing which is uniform for both of these is rehydration techniques. Uh, of course, with the uh, the cold stress, if you've got warmed fluids, it would help, uh, whether it's uh, either PO or IV uh, with, with that uh, matter. And they talk about different vital signs, uh, cutoffs, before uh, you can allow the first responder to uh, go, go back in to uh, the event. And um, one of the cutoffs, of course, is heart rate greater than 110. The other one, if they're hyperthermic with a temperature greater than or equal to 100.6. If you look down at the SO2 scene rehabilitation, they get into a uh, little bit more detail uh, with regards to the pulse and excess of the, uh, the NFPA predicted maximums, which they have listed down here for convenience. And then likewise, if you know their respirations are too low or too high, um, and if they have a, a low uh, pulse ox reading or their carbon monoxide level reading, or if they're uh, hyperthermic, um, of course, and if you know there's mandatory rest periods and reevaluate re them to see if they um, recover from it. Uh, before they go back into the uh, event or they get kicked out and have to go in for further evaluation with medical control. So that's the end of the protocol review for the EMT basics and the advanced EMTs. There is also a quick slideshow that goes through a little bit of details regarding non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And there's also a, another component which discusses the uh, various procedures. Again, uh, would urge that you do not make a final copy of the protocols until all of the changes have been made by the NC Office of EMS. Thank you.